Nike has fallen from its lofty perch as it struggles to connect with a new generation. Plus, Arch Manning will be in EA's College Football 25, and two NFL Hall of Famers are duking it out in court. It's Wednesday, July 10th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Arch Manning is in the game. The nephew of Peyton and Eli Manning initially declined the blanket offer from EA Sports of $600 for use of his name, image, and likeness, which more than 14,000 players accepted. Despite being the third-string quarterback at Texas last year, Manning is considered to have one of the highest NIL values among college athletes due to his famous family. While he ended up accepting the same deal that everyone else did of $600 and a copy of the game, he was able to leverage the Manning name. Arch announced that he would be part of the game in a video with Eli Manning, and he's reportedly receiving fifty dollars to $60,000 from EA to promote the game. His football career is just getting started, but Arch has shown that it pays to be a Manning. Attorneys for Brett Favre are seeking to revive a defamation lawsuit against Shannon Sharp. In October, a district court judge threw out Favre's case against Sharp, but now the Hall of Fame quarterback's lawyers are taking their cause to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. The central question is how viewers interpreted Sharp's words in 2022, when he said on Skip and Shannon Undisputed that Favre was, quote, taking from the underserved, that he, quote, stole money from people that really needed that money, and that it says something damning about his character that he would, quote, steal from the lowest of the low. Favre's lawyers are honing in on that word steal, saying that many people took Sharp to mean that Favre stole directly from poor people, whereas in reality, Favre has been named in a lawsuit that alleges that he and others work to redirect millions of dollars meant for a government program that supports needy families toward building a volleyball arena at the University of Southern Mississippi. His, his lawyers are right that Favre is not accused of taking money out of anyone's pockets, just preventing it from ever reaching their pockets. It's up to a judge if that's defamation or just semantics. And 16 years ago, when he was playing for FC Barcelona, Lionel Messi took photos for a Barcelona charity calendar holding a six-month-old baby named Lamin Yamal. Now, Yamal is the one playing for Barcelona, and yesterday he became the youngest person ever to score in the men's Euros when he tied Spain's game against France. Spain went on to win 2-1 to one, and will advance to the finals against the winner of the Netherlands and England. Nike is conducting major layoffs, especially in leadership positions. Joining me now to discuss is front office sports newsletter writer, Eric Fisher. Welcome, Eric. Hello. So Nike's having some rough times. Where would you start the story of things going wrong for them? Uh, back several years, really, this hmm. has been a sort of a brewing thing that you've got some macro level issues across the entire sporting goods industry where a number of other players, Adidas, uh, some retailers and the like have all had various struggles of their own. Uh, the pandemic, you know, sort of shook everything around as it did in a number of other industries. And then there were some specific things going back multiple years for Nike relating to their own innovation, what people thought of their product, what people thought of their prices. It's a whole host of factors. But in terms of starting the story, we're really going back four to five years in terms of many of the roots of what we're now seeing now take take forth. Yeah, America. that's that's very interesting. Um yeah, I, I've been wondering like how much, I mean, with a company this size, it can be hard to pinpoint, you know, they made this decision and everything went wrong after that. It's not Sometimes that, it's that simple. simple. Usually it's not. Yeah. Um, but can you, um, to what degree would you say this is macroeconomic forces that are bigger than Nike that either they didn't respond to well, or it was just a, a tidal wave that they had had no real way of, you know, handling artfully? It's like everything else, it's complex and interwoven here. I would say it's probably more internally driven than macro. I, you know, 55, 45, 60, 40, something. I mean, it's a little bit of mm -hmm. guesswork here because, again, it's a very nuanced combination of factors at play here in terms of the struggles that Nike is having. But I would say to a slight degree, more internally driven than externally driven. All right. And let's zoom in a little here so um it, what's what's going wrong exactly is it just the sales are are not what what people thought yeah they would so be, sales or? and revenue are way down they are not sort of continuing to have triumphant quarter after quarter like they did for many years really and there are a bunch of upstart companies 
that are cheaper, critically, that a lot of the uh, Nike product is just deemed to be too expensive, uh, but also other competitors that are just hipper and more in favor with consumers, particularly younger consumers. Um, you know, some of us are old enough to remember when Nike was the thing back in the days right. of Bo Jackson and Michael Jordan. We're sure. a long way away from those days. The, the market's very different. There's a lot of other players in the market, and um, there are other brands that a number of consumers are favoring right now. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, Nike feels more in the category of like New Balance, where it's just kind of there, it's reliable. It doesn't feel, I mean, certainly Nike makes an effort to be hip and new and on the the forefront of you know the new types of sneakers but i'm yeah just anecdotally i'm seeing a lot of like on and hoka and newer well, those, brands those two brands in particular have done very well but even new balance an older brand yeah. uh they've continued to be very true and and loyal to the running community and the running community has paid back that loyalty so yes even though you have on and oka and some of these others uh new balance even even somebody like them continues to have their areas of market niche and market expertise right yeah yeah and i feel like that that community piece of it is you know even for a brand this size it's not to be discounted um, cause yeah, new balance does feel like there's, yeah, they've got this runner community. It, it just feels like a comfortable, not like the shoe is comfortable though, in my experience it is. Um, but like, it's sort of a, um, you know, a, a brand that's kind of reliable in a nice way. Um, Nike, you know, it's, it's kind of caught between like, it's trying to be hip and, and the, you know, the dominant player in the market and it still is, but. Um, it's also for a lot of people, it's their parents brand, you know, it's in the way that New Balance kind of is. It's, um, you know, it's what they might see their parents wearing. So they want something different. Yeah. Whether that's on or Hoka or, or, or another, you know, even Skechers, I think, you know, has, has a younger feel than Nike. So, yeah, I kind of wonder if they're caught between generations or just trying to be everything to every generation. I, I think there are factors of both at play there. And, and again, let's, sort of pull back on what we're talking about here is that Nike at once is trying to be a high performance brand for, you know, high level competitive athletes, but at the same time being a major lifestyle brand for casual consumers. Those are two very different things. For a lot of years, Nike was able to sort of have its cake and eat it too. But as the market gets more complex and maybe more fractionalized in a number of ways, that's harder to do. They also made some efforts a little while ago to, you know, cut out the middleman of, you know, Foot Locker and other stores and just say, like, you're coming to our store or you're you're just buying these online. It's, you know, more and more people do these days. Um, they seem to be walking that back a little bit. Is it can we say at this point that that was a mistake for them, you know, that, that they did that too quickly um, or, you know, how, just how would you factor that into this whole story? I think it's a meaningful part of the story that, you know, like a lot of other parts of apparel and footwear, some products for a lot of consumers, you just need to see it and touch it, feel it, try it on, have that whole sort of full sensory tactile experience. We all buy things online, a number of other things, and we enjoy it. There's a certain convenience there. Um but it's, it's a tough thing for a thing like apparel and footwear. And when you also sort of factor in, companies like Dick's that have put a lot of effort into continuing to revamp their stores and have a very high quality shopper experience foregoing that to a large degree, even though Nike, you can obviously still buy their product in Dick, Dick's stores, but you know, putting a lot of emphasis on the direct to consumer digital piece um, at perhaps the expense of that retail experience um, that can be problematic. Yeah. And Going macro again here, I was just, you know, doing the very basic analysis of looking at Nike's stock price, you know, a week from past week, past month, past year, past five years. And you go past five years, it follows a certain pattern that we've seen in stocks. Like, I mean, not exactly the Peloton story, but it kind of looks like a pandemic stock of rising around like 2021 or so, having a, a you know nice little peak around there and then steadily declining down. Um, Adidas, sort of a similar story in that, you know, that they, they had that pandemic, but it's not the same shape exactly. I'm wondering if, um, if some of what we're seeing is just, 
you know, the pandemic hits, people are spending more on their own comfort and their ability to exercise on their own. And that's a boon for Nike. And then as, as it fades out and people start, um, you know, going back to the gym, that kind of thing. Um, and if, if they kind of got caught up, I mean, it's not exactly a Nike's not an at-home fitness product, so it's not a perfect comparison. And I'm, I'm wondering if, if that comparison rings true for you, or if that's more just like a, you know, an artifact of when they happen to rise and fall. Yeah, they're a little bit different in the sense that they've been publicly traded for more than 40 years now. So yeah. we've got all sorts of boom and bust cycles for them. They're, they're a lot older than some of the other companies that you mentioned, and certainly a Peloton um, in particular. Um, I, I think the bigger issue is particularly once you got to the other side of the pandemic and people wanted to be outside and doing things and having other experiences and, and spending their money in various ways, you know, having a lot of footwear on the market that's 150 and 200 dollars, it's a big problem. Yeah. And do you see any kind of like obvious path forward for for Nike or is it and part of me wonders if like they're, they they the dip they're experiencing is in some ways forces beyond their control and obviously they're they're a big company with a lot of capital and they can do a lot of different things here but like these these upstart brands aren't going away and um, you know, athletes you used to be like all the top athletes, basically, you know, it was like Nike or Reebok and most of them are Nike. And, and now it just feels more diffuse. I'm wondering if these are factors that they can't really, um, you know, alter in some massive way to, you know, get back the like the 20 percent that their stock dropped over the last week. Well, getting that 20 percent back, that's going to be uh, that's going to be a slow road back. Uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a lot of incremental gains. They've got to get through this whole three year, two billion dollar cost cutting campaign, which is why we continue to see these waves of layoffs. That's going to continue until they meet that target and get that objective. And that's a still a multi year process that's unfolding. Um, but to get to the heart of your question, the, you know, if they want to sort of have their cake and eat it too again, they got to really serve both those markets. And on the high performance end of that, they've got to sort of bring that R and D uh, chops really back um, in in full stead, and and have a, a, the products that your top athletes in a variety of sports want to have. They also have this other strategy that they want to have more sub one hundred dollar product and do a better job of attracting your mass market consumer. I think that's really smart. And if they have better options in that lower price point, that could be really effective. And just in terms of getting a little bit more buzz around that brand and having something. Oh yeah, I'm I want to wear this to school and have something that particularly students and kids that you know they really want to embrace that brand again and and the way to do that again is having more product at an approachable price point and what can we learn just from you know the broader fitness apparel and sneaker industry here in terms of you know what that that internal external mix of of you know how much of this is nike's mistakes and how much is just this is the economy right now storytelling and connection are, are really important um you look at sort of the inverse of a lot of what we're talking about and the success that we've seen around Dick's these last couple of years. Uh, a lot of what they've done is very, um, very deep and very authentic connection to individual athletes, to youth leagues, to local sports organizations. They, you know, all your little leagues and CYOs and everything else, they've, they've, very deep roots there. But the other big thing is they went very big, very early and continued to be a strong presence in and around women's sports. They were early on this. They knew that this was going to be a big macro societal change. All the things that you've been talking about uh, here on the program in terms of the, the mass spectator level and the industry level stuff, that's all happening at the participatory level in terms of women you know, really rising up and making their voice heard across all forms of sports. And um, Dix has served that. And um, they've made those very deep connections and they are they are an outlet of choice for the female athlete. And um, not that Nike isn't serving female athletes, but in just in terms of having that real depth of connection um, and, and making that making those bonds uh, very early and continuing to service those bonds. Um, that's something yeah. that's really nice. That's a lesson that Nike can take away. 
Yeah, and it also occurs to me, I mean, it's hard to know what is just kind of individual relationships that went a certain way uh, for, you know, for the nuances of those relationships, but they have lost some big high profile athletes I mean, Tiger Woods uh, now is, you know, has his own brand, Simone Biles, uh, when, you know, uh, cut off things with Nike and went with Athleta, you know, the estate of Kobe Bryant uh, went its own way. Um, and yeah, I, again, I kind of wonder is, is that just Nike saying, you know what, we're, we're Nike, like we're big enough that we don't need to be elevated by these athletes. And, you know, maybe that's, maybe there's some mistakes along the way there, but also maybe it's just, there's, there are more options. It's not like there is one dominant player and these right. athletes want to be associated with it. Um, and for the same reason that they want to be associated with those big athletes, um, you know, there, there are other dance partners out there now. A hundred percent. And a number of these big athletes don't want to feel like they're just another cog in the machine and just one of dozens of, you know, name it endorser athletes, you know, within the company stable. And if some, you know, challenger brand comes out and says, we're going to put a lot of our focus and energy and attention on you and you specifically, you know, who's not going to respond to that. And so, um, that's it. That's, an, you know, again, when you're sort of brokering these kind of high level relationships, that's another thing that Nike is going to want to be paying attention to in terms of when the next big star comes along, making sure that that star feels like they're going to be a priority and that their goals and their aspirations and their wants and needs are going to be listened to and adhered to as, you know, products are developed and programs are introduced. Yeah. And uh, you've, you've been kind of tracking this whole apparel story for a little while. What are you watching for next in terms of how things unfold? So we're going to, you know, we just finished the uh, uh, second quarter. Um, and so a number of these companies, you know, we're going to get into the heat of earnings season again pretty soon here. And we're going to get a, you know, as we get into the later part of July into August and a number of these companies start making their next rounds of reporting, we're going to get some fresh numbers and that's going to give some indication as do we get into all the big things that happen in Q4 in terms of back to school, football season, holiday season, you know, all of those kind of big shopping marketing posts will have an early read as to where those trend lines are going. And, and again, as we get into, you know, really critical back half of the year. Yeah. Very interesting. Eric Fisher, thanks so much for joining us on the show. Always a pleasure. That is it for today. Rate and review this podcast on the platform of your choice and throw us a like if you're on YouTube. Thanks for listening. We will see you tomorrow.